Good sirs, good ladies, many years of happy days before thee and welcome unto The Rest is History. And if you are wondering why I'm um, introducing this in a kind of cod Shakespearean style, it's because, Dominic Sandbrook, we have, we're, we're going to do a Tudor-themed show, aren't we? And this is the first one we've done, actually, since The Six Wives of Henry VIII, which we did a, a year ago. Seems kind of disgraceful. It's very unusual that uh, British historians stay off the Tudors, <laughs> <Yes. Tom. laughs> Yeah, it is. Before we come to the theme of what we're, we're talking about today, and of course you already know because I'm sure you'll have seen the title of this uh, of this episode, but I want to kick off, Dominic, by asking you a question. And I want you to imagine that both of us have been taken back in a time machine Ooh. to Tudor England. Yeah. And due to a complicated degree of circumstances, which I won't go into, we've been presented to the Privy Council and the Privy Council have to decide which of us would make the best king. Right. Who do you think they would go for? <laughs> well, obviously, I think they'd go for me. I mean... And why why so, do you think they'd go for you? I mean, beyond the fact that you enjoy attacking the French and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But there's one fundamental reason why they would probably choose you over me. Is there? Um, I, I think... I mean, maybe I'm just flattering myself, Tom, but I think they would see that I would... I would take the necessary tough decisions for the stability of the realm. And I think... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Da, 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 da. It's nothing to do with that. Surely. What, is surely the, on, the, what, what is the main duty of a Tudor king? To have a son. To have a son. And you have a son. And not only do you have a son, but you've called him Arthur. Yeah. So like Henry VII's eldest son. Whereas I, I have two daughters. Two daughters. daughters. Useless. Absolutely useless. Both of whom have impeccably Tudor names. So Katie, Catherine, yeah. and Eliza Elizabeth. But... No good, really. Uh, and no. this takes us, does it not, to the heart of what we're talking about today, which is uh, Lady Jane Grey, the Nine Days Queen. Although whether she was really Lady Jane Grey, whether she was really a Nine Days Queen, we can discuss that. Um, and she, Dominic, I know that you've been doing furious amounts of research for this. Do you want to just kind of um, give the listeners a kind of just a, a very quick synopsis of the basic outline of the plot before we start looking at some of the characters and the detail of what happened? Okay, sure. Um, so we are in the year 1553, and um, the King of England is Edward VI. So that is the son of Henry VIII. It's the son for whom Henry VIII waited and prayed so long. Um, Henry VIII had three children, Mary, Elizabeth, and Edward. And it is young Edward, a teenager, who is king. And he has presided over the sort of white heat of the Protestant Reformation in England. It's furious, it's isn't say. it? Blazing. Yeah. Um, so extraordinary period of kind of religious revolution and cultural revolution, I think you could call it. Um, but Edward dies unexpectedly on the 6th of July. And just a few days later, um, instead of proclaiming his sister Mary, as a lot of people expected as queen, uh, the Privy Council, that's the, the body, the, the sort of repository of authority in the realm, they proclaim somebody else who's not expected. And that person is Lady Jane Grey. And for, it's actually, I mean, everyone remembers her as the nine day queen, but for 13 days, she is queen of England. While Mary is outraged and says, this is a terrible, you know, usurpation. I should be queen. Um, Jane appears to have the backing of the most powerful man in the realm, the Duke of Northumberland, her father-in-law. And I think most people probably think that she will prevail, but she doesn't. Her support melts away. Mary is able to come into London. The Privy Council change sides. They back Mary after all. Bells and bonfires in London. Poor old Jane is um, locked up in the tower. And several months later, the beginning of 1554, poor old Jane, who is just a teenager, probably 15 or so, she has her head cut off. And the great thing about Jane is that she is Queen of England, but she is never in the lists, Tom. So this is one of the great controversies about Jane. Is she queen or isn't she? Okay. So, so yes. Yeah, so we've had lots of questions on basically on that line. Uh, Sander uh, Fearon can stand in for everybody else. Should Lady Jane Grey be considered a queen? So you think she should be? Uh, yes and no, I think is the very evasive answer. Well, let's come, let's come to that at the end of the show. So essentially, to understand this whole extraordinary incident, there are really kind of two major strands to the story, aren't there? The first is the fact that everywhere you look 
in the Tudor line of succession, there are women rather than men, girls rather than boys. Um, yep. And this in an age where it is assumed that men should be king uh, and that women shouldn't rule is a real problem. And the other is what you alluded to in your account about Henry, Edward VI's white hot Protestantism, because Mary is a Catholic. And so it's it's the tensions between Catholic and Protestant. It's the religious loyalties of the various candidates to become monarch that also kind of interacts with the narrative. Absolutely, Tom. Yeah. And, and so really, if we're beginning the story, we need to go back to Henry VIII um, and the theme of our last Tudor episode, which was on his attempt to, you know, he had all these wives basically because he was trying to get a son, didn't he? And he yeah. had, so he had um, Catherine of Aragon gave him Mary, who was raised Catholic, stayed Catholic. Anne Boleyn, Protestant bride, gives him another yeah. daughter, Elizabeth, who is raised a Protestant. And then yeah. Jane Seymour, his third wife, gives him at last the long-awaited boy who becomes Edward and who is raised as a very, very hot Protestant indeed. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think the Lady Jane Grey story, Tom, it, it, it's an absolutely brilliant story for a podcast because it's kind of a who and why done it. Uh, we, you know, historians disagree about who was behind the coup, um, who was actually carrying out. Is it is the coup by Jane or is the the coup by Mary? And at the heart of it is this is this girl, this teenage girl who loses her life. So it's an amazing story. But beyond that, this is an absolute hinge moment in in English history. I mean, this is the, you know, if Jane had succeeded. No Mary, so no reversion to Catholicism, no Elizabeth, potentially no House of Stuart. You know, the English history really does take a different path. But at the heart of it is, I think I completely agree with you, is Henry VIII. He overshadows the whole story. And it's his – I don't think you understand the Tudors unless you understand the, the sort of the insecurity of the Tudor regime because they are parvenus, aren't they? I mean, they came mm -hmm. in in 1485 – with Henry's father. And I think we talked about this in the, when we were talking about the six wives of Henry VIII, that for Henry, this thing about the son, which actually I think to 21st century listeners always seems a bit comical, doesn't it? It's always a, got the sort of hint of Sid James about it. I must have a son and all this yeah. stuff. But actually. Well, and sexist probably. And know. sexist. Of course it seems sexist. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, if Henry, Henry feels that if he doesn't have that son, and if the Tudor line doesn't go down the, the male, the sort of branches, then everything his father did would have been for nothing. Everything their family did. So his father, Henry the Seventh, risking everything in this kind of mm. mad adventure and and winning the crown on the, at the Battle of Bosworth. It, it, if if Henry the Eighth doesn't have a son, doesn't pass the crown to a boy, yeah, he, then he thinks I'll have, I'll have let down the family and we'll have wasted our time. And it's it's not just because. The, the only real example of a female ruler uh, is Matilda back in the 12th century, who who never kind of became universally accepted. She she fought the war with Stephen, this kind of terrible civil war, and her son, Henry II, ended up becoming king. But she herself was never fully acknowledged a, as a queen. Yeah. And so that is a kind of shadow that hangs over it, that, that there is an association between the idea of a female ruler with civil war. So that is obviously something that, that Henry worries about. But there's also the fact that, as he says, if the female heir shall chance to rule, she cannot continue long without an husband, which by God's law must then be her governor and head. So for Henry, that is an emasculating prospect that his bloodline should become subject to whoever marries, say, Mary or say, Elizabeth. Um, you know, and particularly if that's a foreign king, then that's a real problem, Absolutely. not just for Henry, but for England as well. So it is the stakes are very high. We'll see that with Jane. We'll see that with Mary, and we'll see that with Elizabeth. This issue of the husband, you know, is the if you have a husband, he will try to rule, and people will start to judge you by the husband. So that that issue absolutely hangs over. It's not just Henry who thinks so. Again, it's very easy from the twenty first century to assume this sort of grotesque whale, the sexist whale, is projecting his own weird sexual inadequacies onto, you know, onto Tudor England. Most people in Tudor England, I think unquestionably think that the king there should be a king he should be a man and if it's a woman then her husband will inevitably um take over but of course actually tom when henry dies he has the son and that's edward the sixth yeah he does have the son but but just before we, we before we come on to edward and his rule because edward is a boy 
But almost everywhere else you look, there's nothing but girls. You know, the, the two other children, Mary and Elizabeth, that Henry's yeah. had are girls. Um, Henry VIII has two sisters. So, you know, if, you, if you're going back and you're looking at the children of Henry VII, he has two sisters. He has Margaret, who marries the King of Scotland. Yeah. Her heir is Mary, who's married the King of France, um, who will become Mary Queen of Scots, who is Mary Queen of Scots, will be commemorated as Mary Queen of Scots. So there's a, there is a girl. Yeah. Um, then you have um, Mary, who herself had actually very briefly been Queen of France. She comes back she, and she marries um, Henry's best friend, Charles Brandon, the Earl of Suffolk, who is absolute lad, isn't he? He's a very much a, a red trouser man, I think. Is fair to say. <laughs> he re- he's uh, the kind of friend that, that Prince Harry had before he met Meghan. Precisely. He's definitely a, a pre-Meghan friend. I think it's he's a pre-Meghan. <laughs> so Henry and Charles are blah, blah, kind of together. Uh, Absolutely. Anyway, so Charles, yeah. Charles Brandon and, um, and Mary have a daughter, inevitably, Francis. Yeah. And Francis then, in turn, has inevitably three daughters. So yeah. everywhere you look, there are you know it's a, it's a female line, and so that then makes Edward the Sixth absolutely fundamental, as it seems to those who think that a, you know a, a, a regnant female would be a disaster. It makes it makes him absolutely key to the stability of the kingdom. It is, um, and he's actually a very promising heir for Henry. So Edward VI is also at the center of this story. So he's nine years old when he becomes king, um, but he has probably had the best education that any English monarch has ever had. Um, he's had the absolute finest tutors. He can speak loads of languages. Everybody says he's very clever. There's a big, because he later dies young, there's a there's a, often a perception that Edward VI must have been this kind of sickly weed, a pale weed. I mean, that's basically what I was brought up believing in the textbooks. Actually, this is completely wrong. Um, you know, he, he sometimes was ill, but people were always <laughs> ill in Tudor England. Every, he's perfectly, he appears to be, as a teenager, perfectly robust, um, independent minded, very intelligent. And he, and the Protestantism. Very steely. Yeah, he's, you know, he's really dead keen on this. I mean, he believes it. Yes, and the Protestantism, I mean, because Henry had obviously thought that he was God's agent, but Edward really believes that because he stands at the head of this radical process of reform. Yeah, so he's been in, you know, for four or five years and they have been um, sort of stripping out images. They have been getting rid of the last relics. They have been abolishing rituals, you know, Henry VIII, deep down, I think it's fair to say, Tom, and of course, this is a massive simplification. He had broken with Rome about his marriage, but deep down, he was still ideologically, as it were, a Catholic. Um, Edward VI, that's not true at all. This is the real turning point. Yeah. I, was, I mean, Edward Edward is kind of like, you know, he's he's been off to, to study, to do gender studies at an elite Ivy League university. <laughs> and he's come back and it's all about, you know, pronouns and yeah decolonization and everything and that's what he's that is absolutely what he's about he's at the kind of the cutting edge of elite education elite cultural trends um the fervor of 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 purifying and cleansing england of this kind of great taint of sin um and that uh, you know and of course he's the agent of people who who think that as well but he really is his own man i mean he really believes this stuff and he is desperate, therefore, when he, he falls ill, doesn't he, in, uh, what is it, um, 1553. As he starts to, you know, he's what, 15, I think? He's 15, 15 then, is he? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so this matters hugely to him. It does, yeah. That the revolution not be turned back. Absolutely. So he's at the centre of this. He's not the feckless, sickly weed. So at the beginning of the year, Edward VI appears to be in great health. In the new year, they have all their usual kind of, you know, I know you love a court mask, Tom. I love um, a court mask. They have all their court masks. There is much fooling. Yeah, there's great tomfoolery. You know, there's people, there's jesters, there's people wearing the wrong trousers. It's a great, they have a tremendous time. <laughs> the laughs flow. <laughs> right. But uh, in February, he gets a, a very bad cold, which sounds like nothing to us. But in, you know, the 1550s, you get a very bad cold and it goes into your lungs. Y- you could well die. And... um Basically, it seems likely that he got some lung infection that he just couldn't shake off and it became more and more deep-seated and it's going to end up killing him. 
And what seems to have happened, so this is a really complicated story and really interesting. What seems to have happened is that a few weeks into this illness, he starts to think about, well, what happens if I die? And he probably at this stage, he's thinking about this as a long-term thing because he does that. He, he starts to work out what he calls his device for the succession um, to think about, because he obviously isn't married. You know, he's 15 and he's got no children. And the first version of this basically says um, it will go, the crown will go to the male heirs of my cousin, Lady Jane. Gray, who we'll come to in a second. We haven't got onto her yet. So the question, Tom, is why doesn't he want his sisters to get it, Mary or Elizabeth? Mary, it's obvious. She's Catholic. But we have a question here from Andrea with the bangs. Why did Edward VI name Lady Jane as his successor rather than his sister Elizabeth? Because Elizabeth is Protestant. So what's the problem with Elizabeth? This is a brilliant question because it's not because. And I think the answer is because it's not just about religion. So let's talk about those two characters. I mean, this is before either of them are queen. So, of course, everyone will have heard of Bloody Mary and, and Good Queen Bess, but they're not yet those characters. So Mary, first of all, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, she's 37. She's had an absolutely terrible life to this point. She's seen her mother, you know, um, she's been she's been parted from her mother. She and her mother die of cancer alone. You know, she has been ostracized. She's been told that she's illegitimate. Um, you know, people have treated her as a sort of punch bag. She is a sort of short, thin, very insecure, very miserable person who's basically been a victim and been abused and ignored all her life. And she, she was actually um, Edward's godmother, wasn't she? She was, yeah. And she's, what, kind of 30 years older than him? Yeah, because Jane Seymour had, had been very nice to her and had brought her back into the fold. Yeah. Mary, I'll tell you an interesting thing about Mary. She has a very deep voice. Oh, I didn't know that. But she's very sh very slight, isn't she? But with she a deep is. voice. But everyone actually says, although the bloody Mary, she's very kind, Tom. Did you know that? She's very kind. I did know that. Person. Yes, I did. I'm, I'm, I'm very much Team Mary. Oh, of course you are, because you're unsound on the Reformation. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in this I am. Um, <laughs> But but I mean imagine I mean imagine the the kind of the nightmare if you're a devout Catholic of having you know a ten year old boy hectoring you about changing your religion. Do you know what they have massive rows when he's king? He will kind of call her in. I mean imagine yeah he's he's nine or ten. He calls it's kind of like your worst says, Christmas, isn't it? And says <laughs> stop stop celebrating mass, stop associating with Catholic priests. You're an absolute you know, and and they will both have stop it. Burst. They'll both <laughs> I think is what he'd say. They'll both be in floods of tears. Apparently, I mean, in her case, it's surely as you say, it must be tears of yeah, absolute just, rage. <laughs> <laughs> it was this little, she's, a, little she's a grown woman. I mean, she's yeah. she's thirty. <laughs> you know? I command thee. Yeah, thou this shalt is, not go is, to mass. This is splendid historical analysis, Tom. Very good. Um, so there's him. The, sorry, there's her. There's Mary. But then there's Elizabeth as well. Now, Elizabeth is 20. And of course, she is Protestant. So the question is, why didn't he just skip? And I think there are two to Elizabeth. And I think there are two reasons that are at the core of this. Reason number one is Edward VI, like Henry VIII, doesn't think uh, a woman can be queen. He just thinks, bad idea, end of the Tudors. She'll be dominated by some husband. No one will listen to her. Doesn't make sense. So, so you know, best not to. But, of course, then that raises the question, why does he later go on to Jane? And the answer, I think, why he skips uh, but hold Mary. On, but hold on. But hold on. But also just on Elizabeth. Yeah. Isn't it also the fact she's illegitimate? This is it. This so, is absolutely it, Tom. He thinks, and he's not wrong, because everybody thinks it, that Mary and Elizabeth are both illegitimate. Now, that will seem weird to us. Because we don't think they're illegitimate, because of course they were both queens of England. But Henry VIII had explicitly said, um, and it goes back to his, his, Henry VIII's Third Succession Act. So Henry VIII's legislation had explicitly said they are both illegitimate. Um, Mary, because her mother Catherine of Aragon was married to him illegally, because he she'd been married to his brother Arthur before that. And Elizabeth, because Anne Boleyn was a witch, <laughs> married him through yeah, fair enough through necromancy, and that yeah, therefore yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth was also. And there's no reason to believe that Edward the Sixth, Edward the Sixth, completely believes this. He thinks this is he's he's thought this all his life. But Dominic, has Henry VIII also not made it a matter of statute that if Edward dies, then Mary and Elizabeth in turn will succeed? Well, this is the crazy ambiguity. 
that in his third succession act and in his will, Henry VIII had basically laid down, yes, they're illegitimate, but in the line of succession, um, it's Edward I and then Mary and Elizabeth. So it's very ambiguous. And actually, a lot of people... Sort well, of, you say it's ambiguous, but... Because well, if they're illegitimate, how can they succeed? But it would never have been an issue had Edward not tried to make it an issue. Probably, you're right. You're probably right. He's only kind of using it as an excuse, isn't he? I mean, because actually, in the event, Mary proves to be the people's choice as queen. And Elizabeth succeeds without any kind of people, with anyone complaining that she's illegitimate. I don't think he's using it purely as an excuse to avoid a Catholic heir because, I mean, why does he skip Elizabeth? Yeah, the king, the, wanting a male, I think, is, is also I think wanting a male is, is crucial. So here's a key thing to remember, Tom. At this point, he doesn't think he's going to die. And lots of people don't think he's going to die. He's just ill. And in the way that, you know, when you really think about your will, that's what he's thinking about. So in this first version, he says, listen, if I die without an heir, because obviously he thinks he'll one day he'll get married and have kids. He says, if I die without an heir, it'll go to Lady Jane Grey's male heirs. And if not her, then her sister's male, um, then her sister's sons. And if not her, then her sister's sons. So this is a sort of contingency plan. But then that all changes because on the, what are they, on Sunday, the 28th of May, which is this crucial day, so we're still in 1553, the doctors, his doctors meet and they basically have a conference and they say, he's not getting better. Do you know what? He's actually going to die. And um, clearly that is communicated to him because in the next two weeks, he goes back over this thing, his device for the succession, and he chain he makes a crucial change. So instead of the crown going to Lady Jane's male heirs or her sister's male heirs, he adds the word and. So now it says Lady Jane and her heirs male. So in other words, if he drops dead tomorrow, this girl, Lady Jane Grey, will be the next um, ruler of England. And that's the crucial change. Okay, so I've got an obvious question, a question that is asked by the splendidly named Richard Cromwell. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Richard Cromwell. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Francis Gray, who is yeah. um, Lady Jane's mother and the daughter of Mary, who is the sister of Henry VIII, must have had a better claim than her daughter, if you're excluding Bloody Mary and Mary, Queen of Scots as Catholics. Did anyone think of making Francis Queen? They didn't. Um, and because there were... she was past childbearing age by that point, so she wasn't going to have any male heirs. Is that the reason? Uh, no, there's still a possibility that she could have a male heir. So why is she excluded? Why don't they exclude her? Why do they exclude her? That's an interesting question, and other people have asked that. Uh, and the reason is some people think it's because she's thought of as unreliable. She's thought of as kind of flighty and difficult. But also, so not only is Francis seen as a bit f flighty and flaky and difficult, but her husband, who is, what's his name? He's called Henry, isn't he? He's Henry Gray, Marquis of Dorset. Um, He's descended from Elizabeth Woodville. Yeah, he is. So all those greys that were involved in Richard III and everything. Right. But clearly Edward VI doesn't think much of him either. So let's just skip them. So uh, funnily, so Edward VI is really fiddling with the succession here. But there, and, a lot, and so people sometimes say, well, this is completely illegal. A king can't just pick and choose. But of course... There was a precedent for that because Henry VIII had been doing that. So in a way, it, you, again, you can understand why Edward thinks that because he's seen his father fiddle again and again with the succession, succession acts and wills. and But the, it's the acts, isn't it? I mean, it's the parliamentary acts. Yeah. H Henry VIII had it agreed by parliament. In legislation, yeah. In legislation. So that's the difference, isn't it? Well, Edward doesn't do that. What Edward does is he get, basically gets everybody to sign a document saying, okay, fine. So with the Privy Council, lots of judges, lots of peers. So they all sign up to this, but it's being done in a great rush because it hasn't really been communicated to the great mass of the public. And does it have legal force, though, if it hasn't been approved by Parliament? Does uh, well, changing a previous act that's been decreed by a king and passed through Parliament, can, can he just do that? Well, this, lawyers argue about this. He gets lots of lawyers to tell him that it does. Um, but of course they tell him that because that's what he, that's, that's what he wants to. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing, Tom. If they had told him that he had died, Lady Jane Grey had become queen and then been unchallenged or had beaten off Mary, we wouldn't be doing this podcast and arguing about the legality yeah, of the. Yeah. But she didn't, did she? And a huge part of the reason why she didn't do it is because it was widely felt to be illegal. A bit, I would, a bit odd. I would yeah. say. I don't think it's odd. any more odd. I don't think it's any more illegal necessarily than some of Henry VIII's fiddling. 
you know, declaring. Because, yeah, for but, example, but one of the things is, that Henry VIII does is Henry VIII skips a whole branch completely, you know, randomly, which is the Scottish branch. So he just leaps over that as though it doesn't exist. Yeah, he does. Absolutely. But he has had it approved by Parliament. Okay, fair enough, Tom. Tom, you know, we've been talking for half an hour, and I never thought we would spend half an hour <laughs> talking about genealogy and the constitution. And things. <laughs> okay, so I think we should take a break at this point. When we come back, obviously, we should talk about uh, Jane herself. Um, we should. Who we've, we've barely mentioned. But there's also another key figure that we've barely mentioned, and that is John Dudley, um, the Duke of Northumberland, who is Jane's, not coincidentally, Jane's father-in-law, um, and has been, uh, he, he's the kind of the greatest man um, in the realm. He is indeed. He's a controversial figure, Tom. So we have fun with. So, uh, yeah. so we'll come back and we will look at uh, John Dudley and we will look at Lady Jane Grey. Uh, so don't go away. Hello, welcome back to The Rest is History. We are looking at Lady Jane Grey, the so-called Nine Days Queen. Um, and as I said before the break, we've hardly mentioned her. We will, I promise. But before we come to her, let's come, uh, Dominic, to John Dudley. Uh, do you think he spoke with a, Dud a Dudley accent? I don't <laughs> is that, know. Is that your assumption? Um, um, so I don't John, believe so that the, you did. <laughs> so the Dudleys. The Dudleys are... Um, one of the great families in, uh, in Tudor history. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I, I commend um, a new book by Joanne Paul just out, which uh, I was dipping into before this, The House of Dudley, A New History of Tudor England. Um, and uh, John Dudley's father, Edmund, had basically been an accountant, hadn't he? And he got, <laughs> yes. He got executed by Henry VIII for having been left over from the previous realm. It's really important. So John Dudley has the image of his father, you know, being executed um, yeah, and that tells you something about the paranoia at the, at the at the center of the Tudor court. Is it paranoia? I'm not, you know, paranoia. You've got to. It's kind of illogical, but I mean, it's kind of genuinely, it's yeah, entirely uh, authentic. A, a completely reasonable, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> he's been disinherited. Then he gets he, he gets you know his father's inheritance back. Um, he's not really the accountant type, is he? He's much more a he, he's a kind of Charles Brandon figure. He's a kind of man. In fact, he gets knighted by Charles Brandon, doesn't he? He does. Uh, he's he's less of a kind of royster doister than Charles Brandon. So he's more, he's a military man. He's a soldier. He's very efficient. So um, John Dudley, um, so Northumberland, as he's always called in the, so he has a succession of titles. He has first Warwick and then Northumberland. And Northumberland, he's a duke, which is also the kind of, so there are only kind of three dukes at that point. There are. So to be duke of Northumberland is a very big deal. Yeah. Um, so when people tell this story, he is always the villain. I mean, he's the villain of Edward VI reign. He's the villain of the Lady J. Grey saga. And I think most historians would say now that is completely unfair and wrong. Um, so he's al always seen as this, because he's the sort of chief minister, as it were, he's seen as this Svengali controlling Edward VI. But I think that's very unfair. He's a military man, as you say. Um, he fought the Scots. He fought the, he fought all the, you know, all the traditional enemies, basically. Um, he's, he fought, uh, peasants, <laughs> he's putting down rebellions and stuff. Yes. He put down the, rebe uh, what's Ket's rebellion? Ket's rebellion, rebellion against enclosures, which is actually very important in the context of this story. Um, so he, he's seen people think of him as very efficient, very far sighted. He had such a head that somebody says that he seldom went about anything, but he first conceived three or four purposes beforehand. So he's kind of, he's a planner. You know, he's careful and cautious. Um, and what happens is at the beginning of Edward VI reign, Edward VI is, is sort of dominated, because obviously he's only nine, by um, Jane Seymour's brothers, Edward and Thomas. First of all, they fall out with each other. And then basically everybody falls out with Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset. And, and Dudley becomes the sort of figurehead of the movement of all the other bigwigs against him. And Dudley then becomes the big man in Edward VI Council. Um, he's a big, he's a big Protestant, Tom. He's, he's very into his, um, his religious reform. He's very serious about that. Uh, he's big on law and order, uh, because he thinks the previous sort of administration made a mess of law and order. He's also very big on financial retrenchment. So, you know, he's, he's, he's sort of, I think he's, he's, most people would say he's actually a very good, um, sort of governor, as it were, 
of of England's affairs. So he's kind of the the money is is mounting up. Law and order is big on keeping sort of dissent to a minimum. Um, he's a he he doesn't really. I think it's fair to say. Uh, sort of dominate Edward the Sixth as much as people used to think. So Edward the Sixth is probably much more of a partner with him. I mean, obviously they're right. training Edward the Sixth to be king, but basically Dudley's not just bossing Edward the Sixth around. Yeah. Um, but Dudley is the big man. You know, there's a lot of people who don't like him. There's lots of resentments, of course. Yeah. And he has a lot of sons. Um, yes. One of whom, of course, will go on to become Elizabeth's favourite, Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester. Uh, but for our purposes, the key one is, uh, is uh, <laughs> he's called Guildford, isn't he? Yeah. Now, this is the great what if. This is the great what if, Tom. In a different world, there's an England that had a King Guildford. King Guildford. King Guildford yeah. the first. And, and the people of Guildford would be delighted with that, wouldn't they? I mean, not <laughs> They'd necessarily. They'd be the royal borough of Guildford, wouldn't they? They would. And I'm not knocking yeah. Guildford at all, but it's not the most automatically glamorous of places. And in many ways, the great tragedy of this story is that it works out so badly for the people of Guildford. Um, who yeah. miss out on yeah. their chance? Who miss out on their chance. Fame. Royal glory, um, exactly. So, so Guildford marries Lady Jane. Tremendous catch for him, um, because yes. she. But the the question then is: so it's usually assumed that um, Northumberland is doing the kind of equivalent of insider dealing. That he knows what's coming. He's had a look at at um, Edward the Sixth device. And so he's uh, he's he's pairing his son up with the girl who may well become Queen of England. But it's possible, isn't it, that actually it's the other way around? Exactly that right. It's Edward the exactly Sixth right. who is pushing it. Yeah, it's exactly right. So what we don't know is if this whole scheme was cooked up by John Dudley or whether it was cooked up by Edward the Sixth. I think it seems, you know, there's a there's a historian who's written an absolutely brilliant book on this called Eric Ives, who does treat it as a kind of whodunit and really digs into the the motives of all the sort of um, the suspects and and sort of the forensic analysis of the documents. And he he says, you know, it's it's actually not clear that the Guildford marriage is just yeah you know, because he knows Jane will be queen. That actually. The Guildford marriage to Jane may just be an absolutely standard, you know, court marriage. And that actually, um, at this point, Edward may not have changed his plans so that Jane herself will inherit. So if Northumberland had put his son up to this, you know, he'd be playing a hell of a long game. Because, I mean, it would be mm-hmm. his grandchildren yeah. that would inherit the throne. It's a long yeah, time Yeah, but still something to think about. It isn't is it? still something. And, of course, I'm sure I'm sure there was a degree of self-interest. Of course. I mean, there would be. That's completely natural in a, in a Tudor courtier. But I, I think it's to see Dudley as the mastermind of uh, the sort of conspirator plotting all this, I think Rob's Edward VI of agency. I think it's Edward VI's project, actually. So we, we have a question from Dr. Danny Witch-Hunting Buck. Do you feel it was Edward's idealism or Dudley's ambition that put Lady Jane on the throne? I suppose your answer to that, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I'm going to, is that you would say that Dudley had a measure of idealism as well, that he's, a, yeah, he he's obviously ambitious, but presumably he shares Edward's anxiety about, well, definitely Mary, because Mary and, and, and Northumberland hate each other, but there's also a kind of religious dimension to that. Northumberland is a, is a radical Protestant, doesn't want Catholics back. He thinks it will guarantee a Protestant England. It happens to suit him. You know, his son will be effectively king. So idealism and ambition kind of concur. Right. I don't think he thinks, oh, I've masterminded this huge thing. This is my sp- my splendid fiendish plot. Um, mm. And uh, it's pretty clear that he hasn't planned every detail in the way that he yeah. normally does. So you've got this meticulous, hard-nosed planner who is desperately improvising and making stuff up as he goes along. And pe- and people think that at the time, don't they? Because um, this is the age of Machiavelli and the image of the Machiavel, um, a sinister kind of figure plotting and pulling strings behind the scenes, has become part of the the kind of the mental furniture of people in this period. And so I guess that that must be part of why Northumberland comes to to get such a dark reputation is that people associate him with Machiavellian devices and and all that kind of stuff. Do you think? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think it it also, when the whole thing unravels, everybody blames him. You know, all the other people who were in on it. It's convenient, isn't it? 
here's a convenient scapegoat. I mean, there is a slight tradition, isn't there, in Tudor England of basically the the, old, the last king's chief minister gets the chop as soon as the successor comes in. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a sense in which, you know, that happened to his, to his own father. His dad, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And he basically ends up, it's the same story again. I mean, he basically carries the can for all the resentments that are piled up at the end of the reign of Edward VI. And I think there is that dimension in early modern history generally, isn't there? The sort of Cardinal Richelieu, the um, the eminence grise, the power behind the throne. And was what historians talk about, the sort of black legend of Northumberland as this sort of plotter par excellence. But it's also with the, you know, the idea of the Machiavel that it's power for power's sake that there's not a yes. shred of idealism about it, that it's just yeah. about uh, doing down your rivals and making yourself top dog. And, and clearly that's not all it is for Northumberland. I mean, it must be a huge part of it, but that's not all it is. Okay, so that's, um, that's Northumberland. Now, what about the lady herself, Lady Jane Grey, who of course isn't Lady Jane Grey by this point, is she? She must be Lady Jane Dudley. Uh, well, she's Jane Grey when she, yes, she becomes, I hadn't thought of that. She does become Jane Dudley, but at this point she's, she's Jane Grey. So what can we say about her? Well, as always, I think with Tudor England, as a sort of modern historian looking at this period, I think what's so interesting about it is that the, um, the sources are so tantalizing. They give you just enough that you can construct a kind of personality out of these historical characters. But actually, you know, you're, there's a, there's, the imagination is doing an enormous amount of the legwork. So we actually know quite, you know, it, it's frustrating how little we know about Jane. But actually what we know about her is all to her credit, by and large. So she's born probably in 1537. I mean, we don't even know the year. We can't even be absolutely certain of the year. She's uh, probably born um, or, or brought up in this house, Bradgate Park, near Leicester. So it's the sort of one of the great brick mansions that belong to the, the Grey family. Her parents are very young when she's born, so they're probably 20 and 21, respectively. Um, what we know about her is that she we have one physical description that comes from a Genoese merchant who sees her later on after the whole nine-day queen imbroglio. And he said, she has small features and a well-made nose, the mouth flexible and the lips red. The eyebrows are arched and darker than her hair, which is nearly red. Her eyes are sparkling and reddish brown in colour. I stood so near her grace that I noticed her colour was good but freckled. When she smiled, she showed her teeth, which are white and sharp. In all, a gracious and animated figure. OK, so on, her, on, on the question of schooling, uh, yeah. her, the reputation is that she's a brilliant mind, right? She kind yeah, of speaks nine languages and can construe Hebrew and all kinds of stuff. Is is that accurate? Where is that coming from? So this comes from, it's, it's the classic Tudor history thing, where there's the one source, the one fragment yeah. on which people have built up a whole edifice, you know, of, edifice yeah. of speculation. But basically, there's a humanist scholar called Roger Ascham, who in 1550, so how old is she then? She's about 13. Um, he visits Bragate in Leicester uh, to visit her tutor, who's another great humanist called John Aylmer. Um, and of course, this is a great age of humanist scholars. And he, um, Asher says, because he wrote about it, he said, before I went to Germany, I came to Broadgate in Leicestershire to late, take my leave of that noble lady, Jane Grey, to whom I was exceedingly much beholding. And he says, everybody else in the household was out hunting in the park, but I found her in her chamber reading Fido Platonis in Greek, so reading Plato, and that with as much delight as some gentleman would read a merry tale in Boccaccio. And after salutation and duty done with some other talk, I asked her why she should lose, why she would lose such pastime in the park. I, why isn't she off in the park with everybody else? Smiling, she answered me, I wist all their sport in the park is but a shadow to that pleasure that I find in Plato. Alas, good folk, <laughs> they never felt what true pleasure meant. And she, you know, she can't get enough Plato. <laughs> oh, no. Well, that redounds immensely to her credit rather but than going off and having fun. But there is a catch. So he, he basically <laughs> says, you know, what what's all that about? You're a teenager. Shouldn't you be out like, you know, killing animals with the, with the rest of your family? And she says, um, well, I'll tell you a truth, which you maybe you'll marvel at. Um, One of the greatest benefits that God ever gave me, says Jane, is that he sent me so sharp and severe parents and so gentle a schoolmaster. Because she goes, she says, you know, my schoolmaster, yeah. your mate, 
gives me all these books and we talk about it's lovely but when i'm in the presence of my father and my mother whether i speak you silence sit stand or go eat drink be merry or sad blah 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 i must do it so perfectly um as god made the world or else i'm so sharply taunted so cruelly threatened with pinches nips and bobs that i think myself in hell so in other words yeah, she basically is, is escaping yeah. from being pinched by her parents yeah um, i mean if she's his, not good at killing animals then that's awful isn't it well i mean maybe, you can I mean, imagine she, her father kind of no not like her. that like that <laughs> yeah maybe. shoot it maybe so basically yeah. in tudor historiographical style people have spent you know entire careers arguing about well there's enough grift there for a novel isn't there is she exaggerating? Is she is she a stroppy teenager just saying, "Oh, my parents treat me; they don't understand me; they pinch me," <laughs> um, or is this the truth? Uh, and uh, and is she this well, tremendous? Mind? I mean, she's. By the way, there was one other thing about her. So, a man called Sir Thomas Challoner. He said this would have definitely appealed to you, Tom. He said um, she had joined Chaldean words to the language of the Arabs with a skillful grasp of the idiom of the Hebrews. For to mention her speaking on Greek or Latin would be of small account. Other women speak these languages in civilized places. Likewise, Gallic and Etruscan speech had added their number to this English lady. If you were to number her languages, this one lady spoke eight. So, Tom, do you speak Chaldean? Chaldean. Chaldean, all right. Well, whatever it is. No, Chaldean, I, see, do you I speak think it? that's all very improbable. Do you think she speaks Etruscan? <laughs> no, because nobody speaks Etruscan. <laughs> well, Unless by well, Etruscan they mean Tuscan, i.e. Italian. Well, I don't know. I don't. I. I don't know. But if it's Etruscan, then that's a, that. Then that is clearly a lie because nobody speaks Etruscan because they still haven't deciphered it. So there are some people who say historians who say this is humanists, humanist scholars, yeah, kind of boasting, massively exaggerating. They're also her father. Actually, I mean, you you did an impersonation of him as a sort of huntsman, but actually, her father is quite into this. So he's a patron for a lot of them. And and a good contact, so they probably want to butter him up by like bigging him mm. up in their letters to each other. So there's a there's an element of that about it as well. But the the John. Jane Jane saying, oh, I I hate them. They, you know, they're constantly criticising me. Yeah, that does sound kind of. I mean, you can imagine her father like kind of competitive dad in the far show. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any reason to doubt that. Um, it's the one thing we know. I mean, it's also, and I think that there's no reason to doubt she's a great reader. She loves speaking languages. She likes talking to scholars. That is absolutely consistent. And I mean, the reason we can be pretty sure it's consistent is that when we get to the end of her life, when she's in the tower, you know, she's writing letters, she's reading the Bible, she's being very, very serious and having theological arguments with people. Um, so she's absolutely, I mean, she is another red hot Protestant. Yeah. So that's, that's the key thing, isn't it? Really? I mean, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of Edward VI or Northumberland, how clever she is, how many ancient languages she can read, any of that. What matters is her bloodline and the fact yeah. that she is as committed and white hot a Protestant as they are. Yeah. And yeah, that's all absolutely. that matters. I think that's right. So to return to the sort of narrative, so Jane marries Guildford Dudley. Um, their, their contract, their sort of, a, the arrangement is made. Guildford gets food poisoning, doesn't he, at the, at the wedding? Well, the Dudleys have terrible trouble with their health. So, <laughs> so John Dudley <laughs> is a hypochondriac who apparently has this stomach ulcer or stomach issues that mean he's often mis missing. So yeah. uh, as well as being this incredibly impressive military man, um, he's got this, he's a, he's a martyr to his stomach. Well, but because they hardly ever spend any time together because, um, Guildford gets, gets food poisoning at the wedding. He's sick for a month and then he recovers and Jane immediately gets food poisoning. So, yeah. so, so difficult for the happy couple. Jane's illness may be stressed, by the way. She may be, she may be conscious that some terrible, you know, um, crisis is looming and she may be, you know, she may have detected a change in the atmosphere, but also uh, funny that they're, they're very young. I mean, she's what, 15 or so. So they get married. Do we know how old Guildford is? Guildford is maybe a couple of years older. He's maybe 17 okay. or so. So they get married. Um, they have been married for oh, basically only nine weeks or so. 
by the time that um, she becomes, as it, in inverted commas, queen. Whether they have they have consummated the marriage is uncertain. Well, there's food so, poisoning going on. I mean, <laughs> that's that, that's very know, unsexy. Isn't it? But also, I think it's said at the beginning, people sort of say they're married, but they're not going to consummate it because they're both very young. And there's a they're not cohabiting. So they are spending a lot of time apart, but they're not expected to cohabit. I don't think there's any sense that this is a a forced, you know, sometimes in the romantic novel kind of account of Lady Jane Grey, she's been forced to marry Guildford Dudley. There's no sense of that. People sort of say of him, what does somebody, he's, he's a bit tall, he's blonde haired. Somebody says he is a comely, virtuous and goodly gentleman. He's a decent catch. You know, he's the son of the most powerful man apart from the king in the, in the realm. He's, the four, he's only the fourth son though, isn't he? He is, but I mean, he's still. So he's not going to inherit much, and he's always being sick. But apart from that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she's always reading Plato and like writing, you know, letters in Etruscan songs. <laughs> I mean, what a what a couple! What, what some a people couple. might say this is a great well, couple. Do you know Dominic? Yeah. Um, we've done our usual. <laughs> we've been talking for what, about an hour. Um, we have, but let's minutes. just let's just get let's end on a cliffhanger, Tom. I think to keep the people let's end happy. on a cliffhanger because we're going to have to do a second episode actually telling the story of what then happens. But we've set up the uh, the dynamic, we've set up the characters. A whole so take pro, us a whole podcast on a, on a prologue. <laughs> take um, us take us to the brink of the actual story, right? So on Thursday, the sixth of July, Edward the sixth dies, and as is often the way, um, as was the case with. Uh, Henry the Seventh, and with Henry the Eighth, with his father and his grandfather, the whole thing is shrouded in secrecy. Basically, it's an incredibly unstable moment for a kingdom when the monarch dies. You need to get everything. You know, when Henry the Eighth had died, they had had troops in the streets. They'd had people guarding the gates before they allowed the news to get out. This is clearly what happens again. Edward the Sixth dies on Thursday, the sixth of July, and um, no news has got out at all. On Sunday the 9th, uh, Jane is, is shown in to see his counsellors, and she has no idea what is coming. And this is at Cyan House, isn't it, in Richmond? Um, yes, I was about to say West London, but it's Richmond. Um, she is shown in, and the counsellors, including her father-in-law, John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, they bow to her, and they say, the king is dead, and you are the queen. He has got this document and the crown goes to you. And her reaction to that, and and I guess you could say, Tom, even at this stage, there is going to be trouble because her reaction to that is not hurrah, I'm queen. It is to break down in floods of tears. And okay. she has serious doubts about this right at this moment. And, of course, the rest is downhill. Okay. So with a, a tear-streaked Lady Jane, Queen Jane in the great gallery at Cyan House, we will pause our story um, and we will come back in the second part uh, of what has inevitably turned out to be a two part story. So uh, we will see you. We'll see you um, with part two very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.